Good morning, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us today as part of London Climate Action Week's programme of activities. My name is Mardi O'Brien, and I'm the Managing Director here at the Climate Disclosure Standards Board. And I'll be kicking it off today before I hand it over to Louis Woodall, the editor of the Climate Risk Review, to chair a pretty cool panel for us today that will look at the good, the bad, and the ugly of TCFD reporting. So wherever you're watching us from today, please type your questions into the chat. And Louis will get to those with the panelists um, in a little while. If we don't get to all of them today, we will answer them online for you. So do keep sending them through. It also helps inform the technical resources we make available to help drive forward good TCFD reporting. So climate related financial risk has been something that has been central to everything that we've done at CDSB over the last 15 years. The, the first iteration of our framework was launched in 2010 and was an early attempt at providing an approach to reporting consistent, comparable, decision useful information to capital markets via the mainstream corporate report and really help shift capital towards a more sustainable future. And Lois Guthrie, one of the panelists, and I have many of the scars uh, for those first few years after getting thrown out and shot down every time we raised the idea. We wanted people to know about this. They didn't understand it. Oh, legal won't like it. Oh, we can't regulate that. You know, but we persisted and we are where we are today. So in 2015 to 2017, with the TCFD coming into play, it was a really significant shift forward in understanding of what climate related financial risk and opportunity was. And there are now over 2,300 supporters in over 86 countries of these recommendations. And with many of those taking action. The shift in the uptake has in part been driven by the regulatory and enforcement signals that have been coming strong from Europe, more recently the US, the UK, and even New Zealand over the last six months. And I think we're all delighted to see the G7 announcement in the last few weeks on mandatory climate reporting. Again, and I also also announcement on mandatory sort of carbon reporting in a global floor via an international sustainability standards board is all really important steps, again, in the right direction to making sure that climate risks and opportunities and reporting of those become mainstream business practice. So in terms of TCFD reporting, there's still a lot um, of standalone TCFD reports we're reading out there, not integrated into the mainstream report. They're not connected to the company's financials. But coverage is increasing of the amount of, of the recommendations being reported and the quality where it's being reported it is also, I think, increasing. The risk assessments I'm still seeing tend to be limited to certain parts of the business and only include uh, often qualitative information. Metrics are reported that don't correlate with risks and then less than 15% of the largest companies feature, feature um, climate in their financial statements, something that we really do have to work on. But given our long history at CDSB in climate reporting, we've read our fair share of reports and as you would expect there are some good ones there are some bad ones and there are some that need an awful lot of work. So the good, the bad and the ugly. The most common questions we get asked in the CDSB Secretariat on TCFD are how do you do it and what does good or bad look like? We only have an hour today or a bit less so tackling the first one is just as impossible. So um, today we're going to tackle how, what does good look like, what does the bad look like and what does the ugly look like and we have a truly truly super panel to give you their ideas on the good, where improvement needs to be made and, and where we can sort of move TCFD forward on the path it should be. So I'm going to hand you over to Louis Woodall, as I said is the chair of the Climate Risk Review. Now I'm a bit of a groupie of uh, Louis. I've been following his work for some time now. I literally sit on the edge of my seat waiting for his next update. He produces brilliant weekly critical reviews of TCFD reports. I think everybody should read them and I'm so so delighted to have Louis participate with us here uh, as part of our London Climate Week activities to talk about you know what is good, what is bad and where improvements can be made. So Louis the panel is yours. Thank you. Thank you Mardi and I want to say I'm a big fan of yours as well. Um, people who are interested in reading the Climate Risk Review net newsletter can go to www.climateriskreview.com and you can sign up for free there. I'm here to moderate today's discussion and I'm joined with an illustrious panel. We have Miriam Omi, Head of Sustainability and Responsible Investment Strategy at Legal and General Investment Management. Simon Weaver, who leads KPMG's Climate Risk and Decarbonisation Strategy Team. Maria Petch, a lawyer with environmental law charity Client Earth, and Lois Guthrie, who is director of 
WBCSD. Thank you all for being here today. So we are looking at the good, the bad and the ugly of TCFD reports. And though TCFD has been around for four years now, and certain companies are on their second or even third year reporting the language of the framework, there are many stakeholders who say that the disclosures lack decision useful information. So I'd like to ask the panel first, what in your experience makes for a good uh, and what makes for a poor TCFD disclosure? And I'd be grateful if you could provide some uh, anonymized examples for each of the four TCFD pillar pillars, which for those who, who can't remember, are governance, strategy, risk management, and metrics and targets. And I'll throw this to Miriam first. What do you think are examples of good and poor TCFD disclosures? Sure, thanks, Louis. Um, just to put a context on what I'm about to say. So we are an asset manager. So we're seeing TCFD as absorber of this information from an investor perspective. So we're looking through the lens of, um, can we integrate this into the investment decision-making process? Can we make products out of it as we are kind of increasing the effort in terms of sustainable investments and so forth, as well as obviously leading on to voting exercise and all that. So that's, that's the lens uh, through which to assess it. The other thing is we also had to produce our own TCFD report. And I remember writing the very first one and thinking, I have no idea, I'm just going to write it down. And what I said to the market then is like, you don't have to have everything figured out, but start writing, because I think otherwise um, we're not going to get to the good. And so I think there's an element of, at the beginning, of course, it's quite a lot of bad and maybe ugly, but through that process of fine tuning, we're going to get to a lot more meaningful results. So I think as Mardi said, the first thing I want to say about the good, there's just a lot more disclosure on TCFD. There's a lot more quality coming out. If you look at the CDP's kind of letter scoring in terms of quality uh, for our engagement universe, uh, at least the quality has improved by 50% in one year. So that just shows the kind of momentum in terms of quality, and that's great. And that's largely led, as you can expect, by European uh, companies although there are many leading practices coming out of the US and Japan as well. There are also differences deep between different sectors. Uh, we're seeing um, some of the best kind of disclosures coming out of tech, telecoms, uh, banks, food and REITs as well. Um, and um, we are definitely seeing a lot of TCFD-like grid <laughs> coming out of regions like emerging market and so forth so it's definitely been embraced but there's, there's a lot more to be done in terms of it being meaningful so let me just kind of dig a little bit into the actual sections as louis talked about governance is by far the bit that a lot of people are talking about very well and it's great it's it's probably the most important part in that the the board of companies are starting to embrace climate change as a central scenario they are starting to talk about who's responsible for it the the, the responsibility of the specific committees the role of audit and risk committees and things like that and then the ultimate responsibility sitting with the chief executive officer so that's brilliant and also we've seen that the metrics and targets are starting to be uh, uh, anchored and aligned to science-based. And that's what we want to see. We don't want to see the sort of random arbitrary targets coming out of companies. It has to be scientifically robust and aligned to Paris and net zero commitments as well. Um, we're also seeing a lot more disclosure on scope three that goes beyond just business travel. So that's what we'd like to see in terms of being integrated into the value chain through their supply chains or product life cycles and so forth. So these are some of the good. Now the bad or uh, could we do a lot more? Strategy section. Um, it just hasn't quite penetrated through it for most companies in terms of a lot of those climate risks being integrate into the strategy making process of those companies so we can assess as investors how this is going to change their valuation going forward it's either too much too many risks and opportunities or too little or it's just completely separate and so that in the translation the integration piece it isn't quite done um, and you know, we we like to see some of those risks and opportunities integrated into the company's assets, operations, products, services, you know, supply chain, R&D, CapEx, 
it's just not quite there in a lot of the cases. Um, we also want to see a lot more articulation of opportunities. We're not seeing that. So we want to allocate more of the assets into companies that are generating revenue from green sources and low carbon opportunities, but they're not talking about it. And they're not talking about it from R&D perspective. Now, R&D is a difficult thing to disclose, but if you don't get a sense of where they're going as a company, and it's only kind of high level ambition with our substance, then we can allocate capital. So I think we need to go definitely out more. The risk section is also quite poor in terms of it being too broad or again list of everything so how do we kind of link the two and in that and our use of scenario analysis is um i mean it's very very difficult which scenarios to use i think we need to see a lot more consistency of applications um, in in those things for it to be meaningful but we are seeing um, some really good scenario analysis, you know, the likes of AXA or Allianz uh, in, in Europe. Uh, but actually, we're seeing that uh, huge divergence from the really good disclosure to the very poor. And unfortunately, we're seeing in the US where a lot of them are disclosing TCFD, but not you know, disclosing footprinting of the investments, um, things like that in a financial sector. And so... I think we need to really think about what's happening with the leaders and laggards and why are they coming together? That's something uh, I think we still need to reconcile. And the very last thing, uh, sorry, it's a long one, is that um, we're seeing a bit of an essay writing. <laughs> and I know because when I first started writing it, I just threw everything on the wall to see what stuck. But this isn't like, you know, you're not going to get sued for not disclosing everything. This isn't disclosure in that sense. This is about materiality. And so being able to be pointed in what is a material risk that could change the dynamics for their customers is something that's not quite coming out and that might be because a lot of energy companies have traditionally written a lot on risk they produce their own scenarios it feels like they have got the idea by writing a lot but it doesn't mean we've solved the energy problem today so you know more is not better so we just need to think about that and, and i'll stop there excellent thank you more is less in some cases for sure uh, a lot to unpack there miriam and then we'll come back to uh, some of the things you raised uh, later on uh but perhaps lois you can chime in here and with some examples of what you think is good bad and ugly yes thank, thank you louis and he hello everyone thanks to cdsb for the invite to this webinar uh in terms of good uh the tcfd invited wbcsd to facilitate what they described as tcfd preparer forums so we worked with 30 companies over six industries oil and gas chemicals electric utilities construction food agriculture and forest products and autos to um, examine what each of those sectors were doing to respond to the TCFD recommendations. Now, these are big companies, they're very well resourced companies. And I think, although I regard the disclosures uh, that they make as good, I think none of them would purport to be making good disclosures. They're really quite humble about what they do and conscious that there's a great deal that's needed to enhance TCFD disclosure. But if you would like to have a look at those reports, the six reports cover the 30 companies that we worked with in those six industries. And there you will find 200 examples of what I consider to be good disclosure at this moment in time. So I think there's plenty of good to draw on. And, um, you know, these these examples include how the companies work together to look at the uh, metrics, for example, that the TCFD had in their original annex and to develop those metrics to sort of consider what is best for their particular industry. So I think that there is a, a lot of good. I think what's bad, I had kind of summarised um, from looking across different reports in, in, in four, four S's, if you like, the four S's of badness, sustain a babble, specificity, signals and sharpness. Sustain a babble is where you have a lack of coherence. You see on page one that there's, you know, the, the chairman saying, good gracious, you know, we've got these climate risks and then nothing in the report about how they're managed or how they're measured. Lack of coherence and integration equals sustain a babble. 
specificity and substance. You see statements where companies say, oh, climate is going to affect our business. And you're thinking, well, how? In what particular way? Do you mean that there's going to be an effect on your performance now or in the future? And how are you actually tackling that? So lack of specificity and substance is the second bad. Signals. All of our preparer forum groups have said that what is required to solve some of these bad points is more dialogue between the companies and the investors. Because my impression is the companies really will will do what they're told, but they're not exactly clear on what they're being told. And it's as if they're saying to the investors, is, will this do? Is this it? Is this it? There needs to be more signals from the users of information to sort of prompt this, this more specific and crafted disclosure. And then the fourth one, sharpness. As Miriam said, you know, it just needs to be clearer and snappier and more to the point, better definitions and, and things like that. Um, but I, I feel with this signals point, just going back to what I was saying about helping a company understand what's required. I mean, when we've spoken, we've sort of managed these dialogues between investors and companies. What I hear is they're saying, well, we want you to innovate and manage the just transition and contribute to the SDGs and run your business well and be, remain profitable and re respond to the TCFD recommendations. And, and it's a pandemic and you're losing people and you've got, I mean, you know, we have to decide what is enough, you know, and, and I think the companies will respond to it when they have those signals. So that, that's my short, short assessment. Excellent. Thank you, Lois. That's really interesting about the idea that companies can be overloaded at this moment with uh, requests and, and maybe not know how to target their, their reports. Um, Simon, wondering if you could, you could speak to this and uh, to the wider the issue of like good, bad and ugly disclosures. What's the, your, your experience being? Yeah, no, absolutely. And maybe just just to start with, I think sometimes the D in TCFD is not very helpful um, because it stands for disclosure. And, and therefore, people think that it's sort of part of the sustainability disclosures, whereas actually TCFD is really a strategic risk management framework. And, and when it's seen through that lens, that's where you start to get the decision useful information that you talked about, Louis, in the in the question up front. And maybe just to build on a couple of things that, that have already been said, I think from a from a governance perspective, I think there is some really good stuff out there. Um, and I think it's worth just standing back and thinking, actually, at least boards are talking about climate change. And, and, and to give some statistics on that, in the 2018 global KPMG CEO survey, there was not a single mention of climate from any of the, the interviewees across the world. Fast forward to, to 2020 and 2021, climate change is up there as one of, if not the biggest issue that they're discussing in the boardroom. So I think that's hugely positive. What now needs to happen and, and the sort of bad side of it is actually how do you start to push it down within the organisation? And a lot of that comes through training. There are some great examples where organisations are training throughout the organisation which enables for that strategic decision making not to just happen at the board level, but actually to happen all the way through the different layers of management. And in some ways, not dissimilar to what we saw around cyber training five or so years ago. Big push for everyone to really understand it and then the regular refreshes. So I think really important for the governance aspect to see that coming through both in the actions and then in the disclosures. And then the second thing I'll just touch on is, is strategy. And, and I'd agree with what's been said in terms of the, the poor disclosures in that space. I think quantification is absolutely key here. Um, and in terms of what we see so often is around qualitative scenario analysis that put simply doesn't take into account the huge macroeconomic shift and, and global economic transformation that's gonna come from climate change. Whether that's the decarbonization of the economy under a 1.5 or two degree world, or if it's the huge physical impacts of a four degree world. So often those macroeconomic and indirect impacts are not taken into account. And I think it is one of the hardest, if not the hardest area of the TCFD framework, but you really need to push hard and, and really understand that scenario analysis to get back to that decision useful information, both for the companies themselves and then for the readers of that financial information. Excellent, thank you, Simon. Uh, Maria, from your perspective at Client Earth, uh, anything, 
What's your perspective on the uh, TCFT disclosures as they stand today and what do you think is good and what do you think needs improvement? Thank you. And, and firstly, just to say great to be here as well. And I, I risk echoing some of the comments made previously. I think in general, the TCFT framework is a fantastic one. Um, it's really helpful to have the four pillars. And um, we published in our accountability emergency report earlier this year, a study of how FTSE 250 companies are reporting. And we're pleased to see an uptick in the acknowledgement and use of the TCFT framework. 40% um, of companies were giving what we described as clear, clear disclosures on climate risk. What I would caveat that with, though, is that clear doesn't necessarily mean gold standard. And um, I mean, an example of something really helpful and, and sort of decision useful for an investor, um, which we see increasingly and perhaps unsurprisingly in the oil and gas sector, is where not only are all four pillars discussed in a, in a degree of detail, but also there's a certain amount of really helpful and quite practical and fairly straightforward signposting of where in an annual report, for example, this information can be found. And I think that really goes to comments that some of the panelists have made previously on being wary of uh, over information or being inundated with climate change related comments that don't actually tell you anything that gives you um, more power to make a sensible decision as an investor, particularly given time constraints on, on all business priorities. Um, and I think to give some specific examples of reporting this year, just to run through the those four pillars you mentioned, I think on governance, I would agree that it's great to see more mention of um, governance structures, even to the point of saying, you know, such and such a board member is responsible for oversight of the sustainability strategy, for example, um, and even recognizing that climate risk is considered as a part of a biannual risk review, for example. These are all really positive and help us to see that there is a framework taking shape within a business. But when you strip those statements back, you realize that actually there is no detail on how that risk is being managed or what work is actually being done in the background. And I think from our perspective, thinking about this real point of decision useful information for investors who, who make it very clear increasingly that this is a material risk. We need to see that follow through detail. So it's great that there's a governance structure in place, but what is actually being done as a part of that process? And what are the targets that are being set and what metrics are being used? Um, I think similarly on strategy, it's really helpful to see companies acknowledging that they are undertaking a review or thinking about how climate risks and opportunities can be harnessed. But again, that feels very much like a, a promise to do something at some point. And what what makes me <laughs> what makes me I think the most frustrated being being totally honest is sometimes you will see we are undertaking an assessment of this risk and working out how we can address it. And we look forward to reporting in line with TCFD next year. Now, for an investor, that information was needed yesterday. Um, but I think it's, it is it is true that this is an issue that some sectors are beginning to look at for the first time. It's a risk that is better known in some sectors and less well known in others. Um, Similarly, on risk management, um, I think, again, you know, a promise to report in the future, it doesn't give you the information that you need. And as an investor, you're then left in a position of thinking, you know, do I do I have a year to wait or do I need to move on now? Um, but I think the TCFD's recent proposals to start thinking about introducing metrics and targets, for example, is really positive. And, and you know, it's exciting to see sort of what those will look like. And I suspect they will be very different depending on each sector. Excellent. Thank you, Maria. Um, a few follow up questions from one of the panelists has said, I just want to kind of dig into some of these a little deeper. Um, a number of you mentioned uh, board level disclosure of climate risk oversight is, is good, uh, is, is good and growing. Uh, one thing I want to know about is sort of like the granularity you get into, like, are you seeing more and more companies reporting um, how the board's remuneration or how management's remuneration is linked to climate? Is there real connections between climate targets that are set and board responsibilities and uh, board uh, performance. Um, because sometimes I see disclosures uh, where it says, oh yeah, the board 
has ultimate oversight for climate risk and that's all there is and that technically ticks that box but you're not really getting much decision useful information from that so perhaps Miriam maybe you could uh, opine on this in terms of the, the kind of granularity of board disclosure and whether we're starting to see uh, remuneration being linked to, to climate targets yeah I mean the, the simple answer is yes I think we're seeing a lot more of that and we do see um, remuneration compensation being linked to ESG slash climate change I also caution caution massively against it because you don't get extra bonus for doing climate. <laughs> um, you know, you, you have to think about how much is impacting the incentives. You can't just be just a really additional small part of the bonus. Um, and so I think we shouldn't be satisfied just because it's linked. We should be satisfied when it's linked meaningfully to the strategy delivery. And to be able to assess that is quite difficult as it stands now because the strategy link isn't always there. So, as I said, you know, in terms of um, energy companies, there's a lot more disclosure. We can kind of get a sense. So if you see executive management being compensated for digging more stuff out of the ground, you know, in terms of, you know, that's in contrast with what we're trying to do in terms of the transition. So we can, you know, sometimes instead of having some kind of arbitrary climate change target, we have to look at, well, hang on a minute, what are the incentives currently in place that could actually hamper the impact or, or the, the, the drive to address climate change? So that's one. The other part, as I said, the opportunity part is also lacking. So instead of just you know, making sure it's not you're not emitting. If you're not driving your businesses with new products and services, it's not articulated. It's not part of that real kind of plan of incentives. Again, it's a little bit meaningless. So, emphatically, yes to that development. But let's just be very, very careful about how it's being done and how we might actually create perverse incentive in the process. Okay, I believe my camera is frozen, but uh, can you still hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. Well, hopefully that'll be fixed soon. Um, Simon, you mentioned the board as well. I was wondering if maybe you could opine on the disclosures you've seen related to the board in a bit more detail. Yeah, yeah no, actually, I mean, I agree with everything that Miriam said. I think the, the thing I'd add around the remuneration link is, is the importance of, of short-term metrics as well. When you think of the average tenure of a, of a C-suite um, executive in the FTSE, I think it's four years. And therefore, if you haven't got targets within that short term landscape, then they're, they're not driven personally to really make that change. Um, and I think that's one of the things that for me, we don't see in many disclosures at the moment is actually what are those interim targets to get to some of the big brand targets that have been represented. And then that regular tracking of that and, and how that drives the, the remuneration. But saying that, I think there are some there's some good examples that were mentioned by people around actually how from a from a governance perspective, the different committees so in so many corporates, you can get lost in the committees. But actually, the importance of, of where climate change happens at the top and then how it drives through the organization, the committees. There have been some really good examples of that in the, the 2020 disclosures. And I think from the clients that I'm talking about with 2021. We'll see a lot more of, of really good governance disclosures in that respect. Excellent. Thank you, Simon. Uh, please bear with me while I try and get my picture back, but we can carry on for now. Um, Maria, you said some interesting points about uh, strategy and risk management and the challenges of sort of linking uh, what you're saying about climate risk to your strategy. And one thing that came to mind is that the TCFD recommendations talk about integrating climate risk management with your overall ERM process. And I'm wondering, shouldn't that make it easier to produce these sort of disclosures if you're basically just incorporating climate in your original ERM process? Um, what is the challenge uh, in terms of firms trying to make climate risk and opportunity part of their day to day rather than a sort of parallel track? It's a really interesting question. And I think um, 
It, it makes me think of some of the disclosures we've seen where there is an absolute wealth of sustainability related disclosure sitting outside of an annual report, for example. And one wonders whether it would be more decision useful to have that integrated into the viability statement or consideration of principal risks and uncertainties, for example. And I think the reality, the reality is that for a lot of companies, I feel that sectors are still getting their head around what this risk really means for their business. As I was saying before, it's something that's very well established in the oil and gas sector, um, emissions heavy business, that, that risk is clear and actually reporting there tends to be clearer. But, you know, thinking about healthcare, for example, or the environmental impact of um, chemical products on the environment, how can you address that? Um, and so, and I think, you know, to answer your question, it's positive to see the acknowledgement of climate risk in principal risks and uncertainties um, reporting, but often it appears as an emerging risk and it feels a little bit like an afterthought. You know, we know we need to mention it. We know it's a global issue. And sometimes they'll even say, we acknowledge that this is a, a risk that businesses are facing um, and then no real consideration. And I think a critical part of this, um, a critical part of being in a position to develop and then implement any kind of transition plan, particularly if you're a company operating in a jurisdiction where the government has committed to decarbonisation targets, for example, um, that risk analysis needs to be feeding through to the bottom line. Um, and what we don't see is much, if any, discussion of climate risk following through into the financial statement. So how are you working out your stranded asset risk? If you say you have a decarbonization strategy, how are you going to um, you know, evolve in terms of your business products to, to, to meet that transitional need? Um, it, it, is, it is something that, um, as I said before, will be very sector specific. Um, and when we think about what we would like transition plans to look like and reporting in line with TFC, CCFD, we often think of Paris alignment and our principles for Paris aligned business plans. And this is something that companies will need to do on a case by case basis. Um, it isn't easy and we are all doing it. Some of us are doing it for the first time, but there's no, um, I think there's no excuse for delay just because we're not clear on the best methodology. I think realistically companies need to start using the methodologies and the frameworks in place like TCFD. Um, and it's through peer review essentially and the opportunity to lead the market by harnessing TCFD that we will be able to establish better practices and better reporting on climate risk. Excellent, thank you, Maria. Uh, and Miriam, you were talking about uh, scenario analysis briefly in your opening statement. And I was wondering, is there a correlation between those firms that are doing very in-depth, very well thought through scenario analysis and the quality of their subsequent strategy and risk management disclosures? Is scenario analysis sort of like the silver bullet to make good governance and, and uh, sorry, good strategy and risk management disclosures? Or is there not a link? Is there not necessarily a link between scenario analysis and, and the quality of those disclosures? Well, it depends. Some sectors are used to doing scenario analysis like energy companies and insurance companies. So sometimes I think we give them a little bit too much credit for doing scenarios. And let's not forget that you can pick the scenario that suits your um, narrative. And so I really do caution with really fancy charts uh, that really don't tell you anything. If the scenarios start to really say that this is going to be a business risk for us, that we're going to have to develop a completely different line of business or products or services, that makes me feel like the scenario analysis is working. If the scenario analysis is there to just substantiate what they're already doing, I wonder how it's being used. So again, I think um, because we're not using consistent scenarios and the scenarios can be tweaked, I really like to see the industry having a lot more effort about how to assess the use of scenarios and consistency. So we saw a new um, report came out of IEA in terms of uh, net zero uh, in our line with 1.5, which means that you cannot uh, basically uh, invest in any new fossil fuel based assets, whether it be coal, oil and gas. Um, you know, 
at which point do we say, well, this is the scenario that everybody uses, and so we have to be talking along to, alongside that, or do you get do you let companies talk and say, well, we don't believe that's a scenario that we're going to go through, so we're going to use another one. So I think we just need to kind of think, we haven't quite calibrated in the industry how to use scenarios, whether it be at the central bank level, company level, or even investor level. So I sort of slightly caution against its use um, as, as a sort of like a silver bullet. I just don't think it's a silver bullet. Uh, Lois, you are nodding your head a lot to, to Miriam's answer there, so I'm interested in your point of view there. But also, you mentioned sharpness is needed in disclosures, and I was wondering to what extent you feel efforts like um, the UNFFI and IIF and EY TCFD playbook and the planned uh, TCFD templates that I understand are in, are in the works from uh, the UNFFI, how they might actually assist in making TCFD disclosures less ugly and sharper. Yes, and going back to what Miriam was saying, you know, that m most of my work at the moment is um, to um, involve, we're involved in facilitating a project on behalf of the TCFD, working with companies in the energy system, that is main suppliers and users of energy to develop what we're calling reference scenario approaches that are designed to answer some of the questions that Miriam raised about you know, how, how to understand scenarios, how to um, work within what one might describe as plausible assumptions, how to make choices, how to make disclosures based on those choices. I mean, for, so, for some of our, uh, the companies we deal with, that their risk really is that the pace of transition doesn't match the pace of their ambition. So some of the electric utility companies, for example, they see that the writings on the wall, the transition is so dependent on electrification. Their strategies, if you look at their now, for example, their strategies are all sort of predicated on the basis that tr the transition will happen um, and rely on electrification at a particular pace. But what if it doesn't? You know, so that and, and some of them are so influential in the market that effectively they are the transition. You know, they're, they're creating the conditions of transition and therefore the scenario analysis becomes a slightly different beast for them. But from a technical point of view, looking at these scenarios, I mean, a an academic has described scenarios as a tangle of spaghetti graphs that cause the academic equivalent of a pub brawl. And, you know, that it, it, it is really, really, really complicated just to understand how the different models used to develop the scenarios um, should be compared. What are the relative merits of optimization over simulation and, you know, all these technicalities which, you know, are com companies are being asked to have some interpretation of these highly uh, complex things. So what we're trying to do is to um, demystify scenarios to some extent and to suggest a reference approach for companies in the energy system, which we hope will work to um, create a bit more comparability and consistency and, and confidence perhaps, confidence in, in the approach. Can I ask, does demystifying mean simplifying though? Are you talking about having a, no, no, you're not talking about having a, a diet version of scenario analysis or a, a TCFD light? I don't think you can do that because, you know, the scenario analysis must by definition be a an exercise that takes account of a very wide range of worldviews. I think in one, one of your publications, Louis, you mentioned this point about blind spots, you have to make sure that your scenario analysis is not so oversimplified that you are overlooking things and that you're not expecting the unexpected. I mean, that's that's the whole point of scenario analysis. So no, we're not simplifying, but we are uh, trying to give more confidence in how scenarios can be interpreted. We're not developing new scenarios. This is more about explaining that for certain scenario narratives like the 1.5 net zero type narrative what are the scenarios in the public domain that lend themselves best to being used for um, analysis in that narrative and why and how <laughs> excellent okay i'd just like to use this moment to remind our, our viewers and listeners that they can submit questions and we can get to them towards the end of this hour um, but I'd like to just move on uh, to implementing TCFD and, and some of the challenges therein. And I actually want the panelists to think about this from the point of view less of like the companies and more of uh, the task force itself and their stakeholders. 
because I've been reading through the recommendations recently and there are some areas where there's ambiguities and it may be actually a bit tough for um, supporters to interpret uh, what the TCFD is exactly meaning. There can be some elements of duplication as well, especially between the strategy and risk management components. I've noticed in the disclosures I look at, people don't seem to know where, what to put and where, and there seems to be a lot of duplication. And it seems like uh, perhaps the wording could be tightened up and uh, the TCFD could provide a more uh, uh, more granular checklist that, that um, supporters can use. So I was wondering on that in terms of what the TCFD itself could do to maybe enhance and improve uh, disclosure. And maybe here we can reference the latest uh, proposed guidance that came out uh, early in June, which kind of rehashes the strategy and metrics and targets uh, recommendations pretty extensively. Um, maybe Simon, maybe you can go first on, on sort of the TCFD's own shortcomings and what the latest proposed guidance does to improve it. Yeah, I think probably the, the question I get asked most by clients is around quantification. Um, there's a, lo a lot of ask in the market from, from investors, from regulators around that quantification and really needing that to, to be able to make decisions off the back of. Um, but I think the way that the TCFD has always talked about it is it doesn't want to be too forward coming in saying that quantification is, is critical. Um, what we see in, in the recent guidance that came out both at the end of um, 2020, um, but also in, in the June guidance you mentioned as well, is actually more of a push for that quantification, um, which I think is, is a really positive thing um, because every investor I talk to wants to see some element of quantification. Um, I think what we also see in the boardroom is, is if all that comes up to the board level is qualitative analysis, it's very hard to compare that to the other areas of risks and opportunities that they're having to make decisions on. And, and I think it's quite easy sometimes to think if you're living in the TCFD world and, and the climate change world that everything's around climate change. But there's so many other priorities that boards are dealing with. And I think putting financial figures on it really makes it feel a lot more real for them. Um, so I think for me that that's been a really positive thing of, of, of what's come out recently. Um, I think thinking then about how the users of the TCFD framework, the companies themselves, and then what they're doing with that. What we hear in the UK especially is everybody wants to be at the head of the pack, but not out in front. And, and I think that's the huge thing for, for the 2021 disclosures and beyond, is how do we move it forward? To, to use a metaphor, everybody sort of wants to be in the peloton, but who's going to make that move forward? And, and we're actually working quite a bit with, with Mardi and the CDSB and, and the FCA at the moment around how can we get sector groups together to really help them have the confidence to disclose more, um, which will be really helpful to the market. And just to be clear, Simon, the concern about going out in front is producing metrics that may not be well understood or misinterpreted or uh, cause unwanted attention to that, uh, that outlier company? Yeah, absolutely. And it's that comparability point. So you can imagine if you're the first company in a sector to say that you've got a huge material risk around climate change and everyone else is not talking about that, then it's going to bring attention on you. And, and therefore, it's that, that for us, we think that the need for those sector discussions is really important to, to drive that forward. Excellent. Uh, Maria, I wanted to bring you in here and ask about the sort of technical wording of the TCFD recommendations and how that might have spawned confusion uh, and delay in terms of production of good quality disclosures and what you think about uh, changes that have been made and maybe changes that haven't been made yet but you think would be uh, welcome uh, by TCFD supporters. Yeah, so I think um, <clears throat> the, a positive that, that jumped out at me from the June TCFD consultation is the proposal to require transition plans but I suppose what I would caution from my reading of it is that that appears to be only where businesses are exposed to what's described as a material transition risk. Um, and as a classic lawyer, I would just love to see a definition of what that means in practice across sectors. There are a couple of examples given, you know, for example, operating in a jurisdiction subject to, as I mentioned before, emissions reduction commitments. Um, and that is a helpful steer. But I suppose um, and, and I think the other suggestion is actually to require a transition plan. Um, if you operate in a particularly emissions heavy environment, for example, I think 
Uh, one concern with that is going back to this point about some sectors already being ahead of others. And I know there may be a fear of being the first to go as it were. Um, but I think two points on that. One is if, if we don't mandate transition plans now across sectors, there is a risk, there is a real risk of certain sectors being left behind. And I think as the economy evolves and transitions or attempts to transition to net zero, some sectors will become higher risk. And so there's, I think there is, there is potential for this approach to lead to a, a shorter term view of what material transition risk means across sectors. Um, and I think the second point on that is that this is partly why, as I understand it, the FCA has introduced its mandatory reporting requirement um, for TCFD aligned reporting on a comply or explain basis. Now, we, of course, would prefer to see um, TCFD aligned reporting as mandatory now, but there is, um, I suppose there is a logic in the complier explain that there is an opportunity for companies to, as I was saying before, take the opportunity to be a market leader and have a go. Um, now, I know that if you're presenting that to the board and you're thinking about avoiding unnecessary risk, that might feel like a tall ask, but actually, um, you know, either you try today or you try tomorrow and tomorrow might be too late. So the sooner the sooner this um, issue is embraced and we get on top of it, the, the better prepared businesses will be and the stronger their bottom line will be. Um, so I think that's probably the, the main observations that I had on the recommendations. I also think as a general point, metrics and targets are really helpful and they're a critical part of framing decision useful reporting. Um, not just on a transparency point, but also on an accountability point. Um, but implementation is also really important. It's all very well producing a beautiful climate risk transition plan, talking about how you can harness certain opportunities. But if you then put that plan away in a drawer and don't revisit it until 2030, we're going to have much bigger problems than just reporting. So that's another point that I would just be wary of. I think implementation is really key. Um, and that will require a detailed assessment of risks um, as they stand today. Excellent, thank you, Maria. Uh, Lois, I was wondering if you could get into a room with Michael Bloomberg and the 31 members of the task force and have five minutes to tell them what they're, what they're doing wrong and how they can improve the recommendations to make it easier or clearer for supporters. I was wondering what, what sort of things you'd say. Yeah, and I have been lucky to be involved in some of these discussions. And I can tell you that, you know, the TCFD, they're, they're, they're wonderful people. They're so hardworking. They've got a very hard job. What's great about the TCFD is it has the authority of the FSB behind it and the authority that it brings, you know, for all of the sort of understandable um, gaps there are. Um, the authority is really, really important. I think what's always on, on my mind is that, it's this absence of what Mardi and I call an institutional home for the uh, management, if you like, of climate related things. So um, one of the reports I particularly like is the um, ArcelorMittal um, climate report. And in there, you'll see that they have these floating jigsaw pieces that say, well, we, we uh, as the developers of technology for the steel industry, we can fill, we can give you this piece of the picture and that piece of the picture. There are some pieces where there'll need to be collaborative effort across people, in, you know, and there are some things that will come from the trade world and there are some things that will come from the science world. And the scientists are accusing people that use TCFD of think of what they call science abuse. If you look at the way science is being used for climate analytics. And I just feel some that there's this lovely um, metaphor given that all the right notes are on the stave of the TCFD's manuscript of music, but it is not being orchestrated. And I think that's because, the, you know, perhaps the FSB, or I don't know anything about this, but, you know, perhaps there isn't an authority that feels it has a mechanism to sort of control the dials on the trade aspects of climate to the extent that they affect how, how the climate um, changes over time. Um, you know, there's the financial aspects of it, but unless it's all brought together and orchestrated, there will be these discordant sounds and there will be some nervousness, perhaps about being very specific about things where there's this feeling also that the market should develop what the practice is. That was what the TCFD said 
all along this is a market driven initiative we let the market decide how to respond to these recommendations but i think we've now got to the point where we have to say you know you raised earlier these disclosures are quite old now we have to look at them investigate them and say that bit works that bit works and if it was me what i would advise them is enshrine it enshrine it in some sort of convention that actually records what we agree is good and identifies what needs to be done to enhance aspects of TCFD and sets out a process for agreeing dilemmas. You know, there, there are so many dilemmas in this, we don't have a dilemma resolution process. And finally, get more lawyers involved. You know, you, you mentioned materiality. I mean, what is it? Financial, dynamic, double rebound perspective. It's survival. You know, how can we be talking about materiality in relation to something on which our survival depends? So I'd have this convention just to enshrine what we agree and resolve the dilemmas we have left. That's what I would do. Thank you. Uh, on that point of enshrining, I mean, I believe that's what we're starting to see in terms of regulatory initiatives and government initiatives to kind of transpose TCFD into international laws. And I'm just wondering whether um, the panelists have any thoughts about this process where this market driven voluntary exercise is now being uh, brought into regulation and what the pitfalls could be. Um, what I've observed is that there's a lot of emphasis on creating a minimum standards, a baseline, allowing for national flexibility. And that makes me concerned because that suggests that there could be gold plating or green plating across different jurisdictions in terms of the quality of disclosure. And we may have fragmentation. But I'm wondering if, uh, if the panelists, uh, this is my last big question before we get to, to audience questions, uh, it could kind of give me a sense of, of what they look forward to and fear in terms of uh, the TCFD being transposed into national regulations. And maybe Miriam can, can go first with that one. Yeah, sure. Um, so I think you just sort of said it, Louis. One of the concerns is basically every region thinking they're so unique and different, they're going to develop their own. You know, I've been part of the conversation in Hong Kong in terms of Hong Kong listed Chinese companies and so forth. And it said, oh, it's so different. Well, of course it is different, but we all invested globally that the last thing we want is different taxonomies. Already we're dealing with a sort of European taxonomy and now the UK one and, and in, in the US will probably come up. So the harmonization, standardization, on what we expect of companies in terms of disclosure just has to be there. And maybe that kind of, you know, what Lois talk about enshrining it somehow universally, globally, we need a home maybe for that. Um, and, you know, in terms of um, slightly hesitate around bringing more lawyers into the room, uh, obviously Maria being excluded for that, She's, uh, <laughs> she should be driving it. When a lot of lawyers get involved, a lot of good disclosures go out. So I think we need to have that balance. But in terms of role of um, it being sort of mandatory, um, and, and I really don't like complying and explain so much, but I mean, an, an element of the key disclosures like emissions, you know, in, you know, aligned to PCAF, all those kind of things being absolutely mandatory, we have to universally agree. I think that's really important. And, um, and I'm, I'm seeing a lot of global investors pushing back on that in regional hubs as well. So I think we just really have to be careful about this kind of market-led initiative. It has to be planet-led. It should be climate-led. And then we figure out how to do it from the systems perspective is, is, is my thing. And the last thing I want to say, which might be to your earlier question, but this one as well, the role of auditors. And so it's very difficult to enforce, to get countries to come up with proper enforcement mechanism, which is what we like to see. We need to see regulation and we want to see enforcement. Enforcement is rarely there. But the one thing that we could ask of a lot more is that the role of uh, internal auditors, but also external auditors to really see this disclosure as part of material disclosure and be held accountable. And when they get involved meaningfully, then disclosure would start to be um, much more material. And off the back of that, we feel a lot more comfortable integrate into the investment products and making decisions on the back of it. As it stands now, it feels still CSR. It feels it's too flimsy to, to make an investment decisions on the back of ambitions without implementation. And so, yes, mandatory, 
some kind of enforcement mechanism, but at least auditors and uh, committees um, being responsible for consequences. So should client earth want to sue them afterwards, they can be, uh, you know, they can be comfortable. They've done the right job. Not that I'm saying that you would do that. <laughs> I feel having lawyers on has been uh, besmirched by Miriam. We should go to, to Maria next. And I actually want to point uh, to the question of when it comes to mandating uh, TCFD, uh, there are some concerns um, in the US, for example, that if client disclosures are mandated with an annual reports or quarterly filings, then firms will be subject to heightened liability risks, which may actually cause them to produce very small disclosures, very undetailed disclosures to avoid getting sued. Uh, and I'm wondering what you think about this point, because uh, I can see both sides of it. But of course, I want to see as much relevant climate information given to the market as possible. Um, so I'm wondering, and, and yeah, from your perspective, um, what do you feel, where do you feel TCFD mandatory disclosures should be housed and should they be incorporated under the same sort of liability requirements as annual financial uh, data? I think climate risk really needs to be addressed in the same way that businesses would address any other material risk to business. And that means following that risk through into the financial statements, for example. So Miriam's absolutely right. Audit is a very important part of that. Um, there will always be liability risk with reporting. That's not something that businesses have never encountered previously. Um, and I take this opportunity to say absolutely no comment on the um, <laughs> litigation dig earlier. Um, but I think I, in, terms of, in terms of concerns, I mean, having said that, having said that Complier Explained by the SCA, for example, presents an opportunity to have a go at reporting and to your question about whether or not uh, you know some form of mandated reporting should be introduced in the US I think um, either either regulators and policymakers need to do that and make sure that they are clear on what's expected and be well resourced to ensure enforcement um, because otherwise there is a risk with things like comply or explain that we end up with a deluge of information mentioning climate change but not giving decision useful information and that leads me on to a separate point i think everybody needs to be very mindful of which is greenwashing um essentially leading leading readers or investors to believe that a that a product is more sustainable than it actually is i think that is a real risk that we're starting to see in reporting um, you know, mentions mentioning of TCFD, for example, you know, we are proud to support TCFD aligned reporting, but when you go to latter parts of the statement, that information is not there. Um, and there is a sense also of green wishing, um, as I would call it, where I think there is a desire to understand this risk and to report on it, but no tangible action. Um, and I think that there are consumer concerns there. Um, in that sense, I also think the the um, location uh, and, and going back to this point about liability risk, I want to make sure I answer your question. There are practical points that companies can bear in mind, which is the location of climate related disclosures is very important. Um, you know, it really ought to be included in consideration of principal risks and uncertainties. Um, I think there is a temptation in some sectors to produce you know a 200 page plus separate sustainability report and while that looks fantastic and gives a great impression it's actually not that helpful to have that information separate rather than fed through into the financial statements and strategic review there is a real need for consistency but that's also one way that you can manage your liability risk by being clear with what you say um, and I think uh, finally um, the feed through the risks and opportunities and I really want to highlight the the fact that there is a tendency to see climate risk reporting as an opportunity to be sued but actually think about think about the opportunity and think about harnessing that risk and and harnessing the opportunities um, but also be mindful of how you do that so while it's great to disclose a decarbonization strategy if that involves reliance on natural gas for example you need to think about the environmental impact of natural gas. Um, so it's a little bit about, I think, putting a cold towel to your head and, and staying practical so that investors really have the information that they need to be confident in, in your business trajectory. Excellent, thank you, Maria. Wonderful summary there. Okay, we're coming to the end of the hour. So we'll enter our lightning round of questions from the audience. Um, I'll just read some out and, and assign them to individual panelists here. Uh, there's a good one here. Um, what training can we deploy across our corporate sustainability teams to understand TCFD reporting requirements better? What training? Um, Simon, I wonder if you had any insights on what training is best here. 
Here, I'll give a, a plug for Mardi's CDSB TCFD Knowledge Hub for this. There's some great training on there, um, and that's where I'd recommend people go to start with. Excellent. So we have uh, here a comment that says, I wonder what your recommendations are for a reasonable level of detail in the TCFD disclosure, which is not primarily primarily targeting investors. You have to be a very committed reader to gain, make it through some disclosures. So adopting a less is more philosophy addressed early in the session, what are the musts and the highlights to include? Um, Lois, what is the, the bare minimum, I guess, that uh, could be useful to non-investors as well as uh, investors? Yeah, well, very briefly, we tend to, encourage companies to to distinguish between have to want to ought to what do i have to disclose because it's a compliance issue what do i want to disclose because i want my stakeholders to know about my climate strategy and what i'm doing what do i feel i ought to disclose because all of my peer companies are saying what they're doing about the sdgs so if you use that frame i think it will help you to decide but it sounds like this questioner is in the want to category so just think about what you want to disclose to your stakeholders because it fits their needs excellent and here's a good question that comes up a lot actually does the panel have any specific recommendations for uh, small and medium-sized enterprises with highly complex value chains in those active and rather vulnerable sectors for how to approach necessary disclosure uh, smes are particularly uh, trouble challenged by by uh, tcfd requirements and getting the ne necessary data miriam i was wondering if you've seen uh, any good examples of sme disclosures and, and how we can help smes get the disclosures up to scratch yeah it's not an area that i specialize in i know that sme hub is sort of driving the kind of race to zero uh initiative so maybe sort of hubs like that would be helpful for smes what we've done within um league on generals as part of our uh, program is to just basically list out what the minimum disclosures are under governance and strategy and so forth. That's on our website called Climate Impact Pledge. And if you look at any company in your same sector that has a very long kind of complicated supply chain, you kind of get a sense of what the absolute minimum should be. And you can disclose that. If you start to think about listing your company eventually, there is a lot of movement uh, within the stock exchanges about it being part of a kind of listing rule. So you need to want to look out for what kind of things should you be preparing? Should you want to come into the sort of the public market? Um, so again, I might not be the best person to come to, but there's definitely minimum guidelines. There's definitely hubs. There's th things to think about if you want to grow bigger as a business. Terrific. Thank you, Miriam. We could go on for hours and hours and hours, but we're at the end of our own hour here. Um, so I would like to take this opportunity to thank the entire panel for a stimulating conversation on the good, the bad and the ugly of TCFD. And I'm going to hand it back now to uh, the CDSB, who I believe have a, a shorter presentation to make uh, at the end of this. Thank you all. Thank you. Right, so I, I can't hear Patrick, so I'm going to jump in here. As Simon mentioned, we have lots of resources in the CDSB, uh, on the CDSB website, which is cdsb.net, and on the TCFD Knowledge Hub, there is a um, e-learning resources, resources you can break down by uh, theme of the TCFD, by sector, um, there's going to be a report library up there later this year. So do keep looking, go on there all the time. There is lots and lots and lots of practical resources. The accounting for climate work is particularly good. Uh, if you're thinking about that, connecting to the financial, and there's a lot more work on that as well this year. But and we've reached the hour. So I would like to thank our panelists. Um, this has been brilliant. I think there's a lot of really insightful marks in here, not least my new three favorite terms, green plating, sustainable babble, and green wishing. I think, you know, we can probably copyright them to this event today and then they'll go down in TCFD history. And I'll be sure to use them at every opportunity I can going forward, obviously accrediting the source. So ladies and gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thank you for contributing in the chat. Please do join us again for our next event and uh, panel. Again, thank you so much. You continue to be as brilliant as you are and driving the excellent action that we are seeing. You know, without, without you guys, we are not going to get the pace and the scale we need. And, and, and really importantly, the implementation and action that you all refer to. So thank you again and have a good afternoon or morning wherever you are. <laughs>